Welcome to the Transformations Podcast. Here, guests and I will share our transformative experiences and we'll explore how to find excellence in life. My guest today is Jean Ching, a 32nd generation layman disciple of the original Shaolin Temple of China. He was publisher of Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine for two decades and is currently a staff writer for YMAA Publication Center. Thank you, Gene, for joining me tonight on the Transformations Podcast. It's great to have you on. It's great to be on. It's good to talk to you. (laughs) Yeah, you as well. You know, you have quite a fascinating background. Um, I know you mostly on 100% through martial arts, right, through Kung Fu, your work uh, previously at, with the Wing Lam catalog and then moving into with, uh, with as editor of Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine and now doing all kinds of blogs and writing and you're, you're very prolific and we have kind of our backgrounds are quite similar too. It's Kung Fu and editing and martial arts and writing and videoing and, yeah. and different things. You know, you're sort of the East Coast parallel person to, to what I do. We both kind of forged our own strange careers it's and, very uh, strange. Much March, and um, I got I got to give you a lot of credit. I'm very um, impressed, and uh, I've always had the utmost respect for a lot of the stuff that you've put out. Your, your oh, book, thank you. Your movie, they're, they're, they're all delightful. You know, <laughs> thank I've, you. You've done a great amount of work to, to to forward the field, and that's phenomenal. Well, and here in the East Coast, they call me Mark Ching. I don't know why. No. <laughs> Do they call you Gene Wiley out there in San Francisco? No, but that would have yeah. a different to it, wouldn't it? <laughs> one day, one day. Just hold on. <laughs> we'll get uh, Uncle Roger to give you the name if you if you watch his stuff. He's crazy. Um, you know, you have background in martial arts, background in writing, in editing. You have background in fencing. You have making swords. Uh, I, there's, there's just so many things. Um, so I'm going to start with when did you start? When did these kind of esoteric warrior tradition ideas and things start to come into your into your body and your psyche that you were like, I got to get into this stuff? Yeah, I think it's still still coming in. Um, it's still coming in. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I started martial arts uh, when I was five. I started judo. Nice. Because um, my um, one of my cousins came through, and he was with a kung fu team, and so they stayed at our house for a while on the way to the tournament, and uh, that kind of impressed me to see all these you know martial artists. And I remember I had this really lame plastic sword, which they broke right away because you know those things broke. And then they showed me like a real sword, and I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's interesting, and that kind of left an impression. And uh, when I moved to California uh, at age eight and I, and I broke away from that school, I wound up at a Shotokan school for a little while and it didn't quite work out. And so I took a little break and then I uh, um, just kind of came back to weapons. I just always have been fascinated by weapons. I mean, I'm not a big guy, you know, um, I've never been very uh, bulky, you know, uh, and so I've always been a, a tool user, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, if I go to have to go toe to toe with somebody's real thick and, and yoked, I mean, uh, they just got me on sheer. They don't have to have martial arts, you know. Uh, right. But if I've got a stick or a sword or who knows what, that's great. Um, when yeah. you said your cousin came through and you saw the kung fu, where were you living if not in California? Where uh, were you at that time? Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where uh, right near me. Yeah, where George Washington marched his troops to death in the snow. And I yeah. should preface this by saying both of my parents were from Hawaii and had no okay. concept of snow. And so it was actually a very traumatic few years. I lived there for until I was eight. And yeah. it's the only Asian I can remember being there. And um, my, my parents had no concept of how to deal with snow. They built they bought this house that was on this huge hill. Oh, no, um, no, no, no. We told them it's on a hill, it's on a hill. They didn't know, you know, and. Feng Shui said, be on the hill, but the ice in the rain said, don't be on the hill in the winter. <laughs> yeah, my dad, actually, today is my uh, my dad's heavenly birthday. So, uh, uh, But uh, I remember him telling me a story at one point where he was shoveling snow off the off the hill and uh, slipped and fell, slid all the way down the hill, climbed up, did that about four or five times until he realized, 
what am I doing here? I'm Hawaiian. What am I doing? Here? Right. I'm not built for the snow. And then we got here to California. So nice. Well, yeah, yeah. that's another kinship we have is Valley Forge is about 15 minutes from here, the Valley Forge Park ah. and uh, and all the little cabins out that you can see from yeah, the historical I have, part. I have so very faint memories of, you know, playing on those battlefields, you know? Yeah. I like to say it right nice. battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so from you, you went from judo into Shotokan and then um, what happened next from there? Where did, where did you end up from there? I took a break for a little while. And then when I got back into it, I was just totally fascinated with swords. And um, yeah. so uh, it turned out that um, uh, there was a fencing class available. There was kendo in our area. You know, the San Francisco Bay Area is, is, is a mecca for martial arts. All the Asians came here first. Yeah. Time. Great. Um, so, uh, and then there was Wing Lao and Kung Fu. And I remember actually back then, his school was just this little rented space in an industrial park. And he had this weapons rack of just all these crazy weapons around the so office. Cool. And I remember looking at that and just like, hmm, okay, I did, those are a lot of really interesting weapons. I'd love to learn those. And I was like, oh, well, it's going to be a year before you even can pick up a staff. And I'm like, I'm in. I mean, I'm, <laughs> what else? Let's do it. And so, yeah. um, you know, a lot of my weapons are still actually – uh, Bakshi Lund's things that I learned from Wing ah, um, that he nice. built my foundation. Uh, yeah. And then I was fencing all through, uh, all through high school and, um, like um, Saber Epe Foil. Like what was your, when I was fencing back at that point, I was just fencing mostly foil, but I mean, whatever, yeah. you know, it was, it was adult education and I went to a, uh, uh, fencing camp at San Jose State nice. where, uh, Maestro Michael DeStaro was teaching, and um, uh, there's actually a documentary called Stro, which is what we called him, Maestro for Stro. He was he, oh, Stro. Yeah, yeah. He was a uh, 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 from Brooklyn and had a really thick Brooklyn accent, and uh, nice. not your typical um, fencing uh, coach. Um, so yeah, there's a documentary. It's available on Amazon Prime. Check it out. Stro, S T R O, um, nice. and. Uh, I went to that camp and I, at that point I was a senior in high school and he, I was going to go to a community college and try to figure out my life. And he said, you know, uh, the instant you step into a community college, you start losing NC2A years and, you know, come to, come to San Jose State, it's going to cost a little bit more, not too much more, but because you've got this background, uh, you'll probably make the team first year, which I did. Nice. Um, and, uh, at that point I was in, I, I was doing, uh, Epe, he put me on the Epe team because that was, you know, he was a saber fencer. So it was, he had great saber fencers. He had great foil fencers. Um, Epe was kind of the weakest team of his, which, you know, he actually, he had won this championship in Epe because he had just had to sub for somebody and he never really practiced it. He just won it because he was such a great fencer. Yeah. So he kind yeah. of thought down on it a little bit. But uh, for me, it was perfect because Epe is kind of the real, the closest to real dueling. And, right. Um, on the same, at the same time, there was a program that was headed by uh, Maestro William Gogler at the time. He was actually a professor of art uh, history at the university, mm. but he had designed this, um, the only at that time fencing master certification program. And when oh. we went through it, we were actually under ROTC. So, okay. um, you know, because it was a military tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, Italian fencing, which was like this uh seldom used it's it's a very archaic style now uh, at one time it, it dominated but uh uh now it, it it uses very antiquated techniques and mm -hmm. he was very being an art historian he was very into the history of it and teaching you know really old school theory it was great again for me given what i wound up doing to get all that structure um and to work in in european languages instead of Chinese, which are, are a little bit easier to translate. Um, right. And uh, there's an incredible amount of, of extant written material in the art of fencing. Um, this shelf right here I'm pointing to is uh, almost all fencing. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So Hungarian, Italian, German, all the European, English, books by Aldo Nadi, 
a group of stuff translated and untranslated. Yeah. Yeah. Big so, fan. Um, Master Goggler was uh, under Naughty. So, oh, really? Those, yeah. Those the, like the Bible to us. And uh, I read, I read Nadi and I'm like, man, this guy is like a master swordsman. Indeed. It's like, you feel like you're sitting at a fireplace with him or at, you know, having, having Yamcha, right. And the master's right. telling you the right. secrets when you read the book. It's so cool. Yeah. It's beautifully written. That, that introduction where he talks about fighting the live tool is just right. Just so engaging. So gripping, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I fenced through college and kind of gave it a break afterwards. Um, I did, I did get a provost master degree, um, in fencing through that program oh. because, you know, it was available. Um, great. And, uh, uh, you know, it did a lot. I think the, one of the things I really like about fencing is it's very, um, it's very logical. It's almost mathematical. Mm -hmm. And so the structure of it, uh, gave me this great framework in contrast to the Chinese martial arts, which is very abstract, very almost poetic, um, but it's very difficult to find that structure. Um, also, it made reading Bruce Lee's writing make a lot of sense because, oh yeah, you know, I, I've always one thing that I fault a lot of Jeet Kune Do guys on is if you've never done fencing, this is just he rips some of that theory out, and it's brilliant. Yeah. It really works. It's yeah. like his his front hand is it's the right hand. He fights southpaw, and that's his foil, right? Just come in move bridge and, and, and attack. It's all from fencing. Right. So much of it. Right. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So, I mean, I think it's the perfect, um, metaphor or, or analogy in that to try and bring this Eastern concept over to the West to map it on something that already exists in the West mm -hmm. is one of those, you know, things that you, you just, it, it would have been amazing to see what Lee could have done had he really brought all that theory to fruition. You know, right. we're, we're working with nodes, right? Right, uh, yeah. right. So is that a gim next to you, a Chinese straight sword? Indeed, yeah. It's one yep. of uh, the ones that Wing La made. I oh, nice. I, you know, I so how do you... <laughs> I'm sorry, what's that? I decorate with weapons, so, you know. Yeah, well, that's... You do you too. Know. <laughs> yeah. 45 degrees to my left is my weapons rack. <laughs> so... There's a few um, on there. That's nice. Oh yeah, just books. And there's some swords. There's a straight sword and a broad sword. And oh, yeah. if I turn, you can see a couple of Filipino swords at the top. Very nice. Some banners. This is just my like study space. Gotcha. Um, how nice. do you find the uh, the techniques of using the Chinese straight sword versus the Western foils and epées? You know, uh, funny you should ask that actually, because one of my um, classmates back in the day was also a fencer, and we used to we used to. Um, uh, ruminate over that a lot. Um, I think the biggest gap with a lot of Chinese practitioners with weapons is that they don't actually practice with them, you know, in, in terms of sparring. I mean, that's right. a, a flaw in Chinese martial arts in general. Right. It's a two man set instead of the yeah. free flow. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I find a lot of the principles made a lot of sense. A lot of things unraveled in terms of mm -hmm. looking at applications of the form and then, you know, visual kind of mapping that on top of uh, Western fencing. Um, it, it definitely, you know, I also do Iaido too. So I, I, oh, mm -hmm. I did Kendo for a while when I was in college. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's always so many ways you can use the art of razor. Right. Um, and so some things are very universal. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I love the 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 game set and the uh, and the and the Dao set. You know, I I love what the Chinese martial arts have done with all their weapons. I mean, they're so exotic and so wonderful. And if you really start digging in and pull out those applications, it's it, they're brilliant. They're really brilliant yeah. positions. Um, I, I find a lot of people miss them though, and more so within the weapons because they just you know they don't really you know it, it astounds me how many uh martial arts uh, kung fu people have never cut have never like tr cut anything with a real sword right you, you see that in the japanese practice you, there's some of that in the filipino practice too right you do yeah that. yeah you know and it's different when you're actually cutting with a blade versus hitting with a stick right absolutely a different trip yeah the whole motion is different 
right, yeah. right. the wrist action, the motion, the angle, it's all different. Right. You got to draw yeah. that cut or push that cut, which was actually mm -hmm. a big thing that. Uh, and then there's hacking moves, which, right. you know, like, like the duck on the uh, thing in the Chinese restaurant, you know, you're <laughs> hacking the pork. But right, the right. char shoe, you know, <laughs> you know, cut the forearm off, boom, bring the blade back up right away, rather than going all the way through because it's single handed instead of like a samurai with right. a katana or something. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I, I kind of feel that it's all there in Chinese martial arts. Um, you just need to unravel it, you know, yeah. like, to like a koan, you've got to you, know, you can just kind of take it in literal value and practice it like a lot of the Tai Chi sort people do. And, you know, that's great. That's great for health and balance and all that stuff. And if that's as far as you want to go into it, that's right. not being at all critical of that at all. Um, but um, uh, it, it, there, there are such levels of depth that you keep digging at it, you know, and uh, it just I mean, once in a while, I'll be at some of these swords forms I've been working for 20 years, 30 years. And every once in a while, there'll be like a little light go off like, Oh no, this technique could go this way and there'd be this whole other thing. And I got right. my interpretation, you know? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, there's all these old manuals, Yuda Yao and Chi Ji Guan, and they're all talking yeah. about theory and principle and strategy with the sword, Chinese sword. Right. You know, it just got lost when it went to two man sets and didn't go into worry, uh, military training, so to speak, you know, when it came out right. of that into into tradition or, or uh, civilian self-defense or whatever. You don't have that same, I guess, need or purpose to, to drill like that. I'm, I'm not sure either, but somewhere along the line, all that stuff kind of got buried under the, yeah. Yeah. the memorized, the memorized sequencing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. That's definitely a way to train with weapons because you can't be like, <laughs> right. everybody yeah. all the time. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, and, and no matter what, you know, we don't, nobody really trains sword practically because we seldom get into sword fights. Um, but yeah. Sword, man, give me my chance. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> situations where, a couple situations where we dealt with, like I dealt with a break in once and, and you know, the, the guy didn't make it in the house. But, um, you know, it was like that moment, like, okay, what do I grab? What, what do I grab? You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, um, Actually, when I was working at um, uh, American Fencer Supply, um, we had this uh, uh, for for the summers because summers were kind of slow. Um, the, they had me hand draw all the weapons because we were producing our catalog, cat our catalog, uh, uh, xerographically, and those mm. were better than photos. This is long before Photoshop, right? And so I spent my summers up there drawing blades. And we had this little showroom, and every once in a while, we were, we were down in Folsom Street, which was kind of a uh, industrial area. But every once in a while, some homeless person or, or, or you know, it was close to a lot of halfway houses. People would come in, and there was always this discussion of what weapon to grab, you know. And I, I was up in what was called the cage. It was our break room, but this was also where we kept all our high end uh, swords, you know, like all the pieces. There was many of a time where I was just ruminating over what what weapon should I grab? You know what? <laughs> You're like I've got thirty seven seconds to pick the best weapon before he comes in the through the door. You know, <laughs> right? Exactly. You know, you gotta you gotta kind of think that out before. I guess that's what kind of prepper <laughs> philosophy <laughs> strategy. And you were with you were with Wing Lam for a long time, right? I mean, a yeah. few decades. Yeah. Let's say I started. Mm -hmm. I started with him in the early seven, uh, mid seventies. Mid seventies. I was mm -hmm. there until around about the millennium, around about uh, when when I when I went to take over uh, uh, when I started working at uh, Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, Did, now he he teaches well, Northern Shaolin, right, Baksilum, and also Hungar, Hungar, yeah. and Nase Fu Hungar as well. That's correct. Yeah. And so did you learn, and Tai Chi, <laughs> yeah. did you learn all of those things with him or did you specialize just no. in the Northern? I mean, I, I, don't know, yes, but... in, yes. I specialized in Buxi Lam. Um, he did run our, the instructors group through some of the, the Honga. Uh, so I got a taste of it. Um, but yeah, it, you know, I just, I didn't keep it, which much to my um, regret actually, because 
it is such a beautiful system. And I think it's one that you can carry into your autumn years. Uh, whereas a lot of bucks, you know, <laughs> my kicks, man, you know, it's going to be a struggle. Um, I did learn Tai Chi from him. Um, and then there was this big movement in that, you know, in the Bok Lum tradition from Gu Yuzhang, we had Sun style Tai Chi, but Gu Yuzhang right. was actually a, a contemporary of Sun Lutang who creates Sun style prior to when he created Sun style. Um, Sun style mm. was created very late in life for Sun Lutang. And so what we were doing was kind of this weird Yang style. And, uh, huh. and then one of uh, Wing Lam's Kung Fu brothers figured this out and then went and contacted Sun Jin Yun, Sun Lutang's daughter, and got recovered the, the original form and brought that into the school. And so that, and that was nice. really long. Now it's become very popular. I mean, Tim Carvel had the great book on it. And uh, right. a lot more people are, are kind of, it's much more propounded. But that was very early in. And I was actually the one that was tasked to go, because uh, you know, when a Sifu meets another Sifu, they're supposed to send an emissary. So I was the one that mm -hmm. went in with the banners and, you know, and everything. And, and, and that nice. You. And then so, you know, I got a couple private lessons from her and then some other successive lessons from her. I wouldn't say I was her student, but then, you know, I kind of let that form go for a while. And then actually recently I did an interview with uh, Yang Chen Han, uh, uh, Yang Shao Yu's uh, son-in-law, who had just yep. done a Chen, uh, Chen uh, Sun style video. And we were talking, hmm. and started thinking, man, you know, I did learn that. And uh, we used to do it we, when I worked for Wing Long, we'd have a, a, a Tai Chi break instead of a coffee break. So for, you know, we'd all get up and for like 20 minutes, we'd run the form a couple of times. And so that was really special. And I, and I was like, wow, you know, I did that with, I did that with Sifu Lam for a couple of years. And then I, you know, I, I train with Sun Jen Yun. I should really right. form back, which is what I did a couple of years after that interview. So, and so now I'm playing it pretty regularly. Oh, good. I, yeah. That's a, you know, it's a delightful form. And, you know, I figure I should hang on to it because <laughs> I took <laughs> something from all my teachers. And even though, you know, I only encountered Sun Jen Yun a couple of times, you know, I wouldn't go so much. Say that that's right. still more than many, you know, yeah. than many yeah. people. So, yeah, my, it my, is a it is a fairly simple style to get a hold on because there aren't many physical impediments like there are with some of the other styles that require a lot more deepness or Chen style, right? That explosiveness, you know. So yeah, you know, let's see. I'll do something with it right now. It's just it's my 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 cool down and meditation form. One of them. Mm -hmm. I yeah, like, I was going to ask next about if you had a. A meditation practice at all as part of your you know training development cool down not, collect yourself yeah not really in the sense of uh i mean I, I took my zen vows but not really in the sense of a zen meditation i don't sit for right 45 minutes at a wall i should um, but <laughs> I, uh, I do a little i do a little john dong after my uh after my qi gong but yeah, yeah a few minutes so i, I yeah, yeah. It's just to try to settle everything down, get that set. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you do the Tai Chi right in the right frame of mind, it's like meditation too, as long as you don't have to think of what moves next. Like if it's in your body right. and you can, like when you drive from here to wherever, you're not thinking, you're just, the car's just going in. Right, right. You know, if your Tai Chi is on autopilot, that. Those are kind of an, a moving meditation to some degree. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to right. have the same level of awareness, you know, whether you're sitting still or where you're, you know, fighting off hundreds of imaginary enemies, mine should be the same, right? Right. But, um, you know, that's it's tougher to do in moving meditation. It's it's really mm -hmm. hard that presence when you're you know swinging a guandao around or trying oh. to hit with yeah. a two-sectional staff. You know, it, well, it, yeah. But it's part but of the joints are moving, the muscles are contracting cardiovascularly, and your, your yeah. blood pressure is changing, your your heart rate. You know, totally. Yeah, the wind. Hard to meditate with all that happening. <laughs> but you're supposed to. That's the, what you're supposed to. You're yeah. Supposed to. That's what we're striving for, right? Yeah. Were you a fan of uh, of martial art movies growing up with all this love of swords? I mean, oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. Kurosawa films, Seven yeah. Samurai, you know. Yeah. Yeah. By far, Seven Samurai has got to be my top favorite film. Yeah. 
And then, of course, Shaw Brothers. And Shaw Co- Brothers. Zatoichi. Zatoichi. You know, Lone Wolf and Cub. I mean, there's so many cool <laughs> Japanese <laughs> board films. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, I actually, I had Criterion, and I watched the entire uh, Zatoichi series chronologically. And wow. that's amazing, because there's, like, subtle character development throughout that arc. And ah, it's see? Probably, it's probably changes just that Shintaro Katsu was experiencing in his life, but you can totally right. see crazy progression in how the storylines moved and how the choreography changes, and all those films are so beautiful, you know? The, oh, yeah. The, Some of the scenes are, in, that you know, are just gorgeous, you know, where they have snowfall, yeah. and there's a cherry blossom and a wall and a woman, and, and then there's a fight. And it's just the whole cinematography, the lighting, everything is beautiful. You know, Katsu's, you know, that he could pull off, especially some of the earlier films where he was doing these long kind of one or fights. Right. He'd pull off all these crazy fights with his eyes all rolled up and doing the backward swords. Right. You know, and I mean, his, his noto, his, his sheathing was always just so beautiful. Right back in. Right back in. Never cut a thumb off or anything. <laughs> Who knows how many takes that took, but. I love that series, you know. Yeah. Very dear to my heart. Man. So did it want to make you become a masseuse? <laughs> make your body work and blind yourself no, so you could no. use that Luigi? No. no. But, you know, my eyes are starting to go, so maybe. No. <laughs> no. Did you have any interest you know, in, like, what is a masseuse? Kina, ditta, massage, any of those types of things along with your Kung Fu training? You know, uh, Wing Lam was a big uh, ditta job. He, he saw... Uh, client, not just in the martial arts realm, but in the Chinese community. Um, and one of the things that was somewhat of a delight discovery when I was working for the company is that I'd be with him, you know, all day, and I would see this huge, uh, all these clients that would come in from Chinese community who weren't martial artists at all. Right. That really uh, made me respect his 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 did that work. And I, yeah, it's like street cred. When the non-students are coming in and so for injury. I learned some stuff from him, but it was very yeah. informal. You mm-hmm. know? Um, yeah, it was really informal. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I don't think he was, was even that comfortable teaching it, but he would share whenever asked him questions. So, and, yeah. Uh, I had a lot of things that I was, you know, I'd get injured all the time. So I was always asking him, what are you doing? You know? And, uh, I had a lot of allergy issues and he helped me with that. You know, I, I live in Santa Cruz and I'm really close to uh, five branches Institute. In fact, I, I did mm-hmm. a little work for them when, when I, when I left, uh, well, when the magazine closed and I was, you know, bouncing around the beginning of the pandemic, trying to find work. Um, so the Kung Fu school that I, I train at right now is uh Sifu Ted Mancuso who runs. Oh, Pum- nice. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Ted and Robbie from, uh, from uh, Wing Lam, right? We both train with Wing Lam. Um, but all, a lot of his students are acupuncturists and Chinese medics. And so, yeah. I, mean, I really, think Ted also trained with Adam Su, right? Yeah, that's his, that's yeah. his main source. I think Adam introduced me, introduced me to Ted or mm-hmm. introduced us to each other. Oh, no, um, no. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mainly he's propounding Adam Su's, a lot of that Adam Su stuff and, um, his uh, his uh, his bakwa in particular, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's, you know it's nice to have Marshall family, you know, and, and for sure, very, very generous to allow me to, to to train there, you know, and I do my own thing, and, you know, because I got like a lot of forms that I try to keep up, you know, too many forms. <laughs> it's hard. Plus, you got a lot of stuff you're working on, you know, Iaido and fencing and Tai Chi and. And I don't. I don't fence anymore. Kung, I stopped fencing I years ago. Um, you know, yeah. I think because fencing, it's very one-sided. Yep. Already really lopsided, so it was really you know I was tearing up my wrist, tearing up my elbow. Um, I had basically ten, really bad tennis elbow, fencer's elbow, swordsman elbow, and that was messing everything up. So yeah, um, yeah, I, I I haven't fenced. <laughs> The last time I fenced was in the window of a gay club in San Francisco. There it is. Yeah. Um, I thought I saw you there. Wait, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, you know, uh, the fencing shop that I worked for, uh, it, it was in South of Market, 
which has a great, you know, uh, gay community, BDS community, a lot of warehouses. Now it's all gentrified. It's all different. But back when I was there, we'd have like a lot of rave, you know, or precursor, the, 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 you know, gay raves in these warehouse clubs. And uh, they did this one called uh, All White Night, where everybody had to wear all white and they would project lights on everybody. And they like fencers. Oh. So because wow. we're all white, so. In white, yeah. Yeah, they hired us to fence in the window of the, as people were coming in, which was kind of absurd, but, uh, you know, it was a gig. That was probably one of the yeah. last I really fenced. <laughs> I'm not judging. <laughs> but also, if you're in the white fencing gear, you, you look like a mannequin, too. So it's like moving yeah. mannequins in a window, right? Yeah, so. I, I kind of think of it more like the whores in Amsterdam, but, you know. You won't call well, that, that too. <laughs> <laughs> as yeah. long as you got paid in some tips, I mean, it's all good. It's, you know? uh, it certainly opened up, up a lot because I, I was glad to have actually – to have penetrated a rave at that time because it was before e when EDM was just kind of coming to the U S and mm -hmm. it was really coming predominantly through the LGBTQ circles. And, uh, so to get into that early and to see it, you know, when I, now I work a lot of EDMs. So I, I, I'm just glad to have had to have gotten on, on that bus a little earlier. You know? mm -hmm. I had a sense of where it was coming. How did you get the opportunity to start working for Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine? How did that come about? Uh, I was kind of, you were their editor for the longest time. So uh, yeah, I started in 1999. Uh, Martha Burr was an editor at that point. Um, and I was taken on oh, Martha, as, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was taken on as the, uh, uh, associate, uh, associate or assistant publisher, but then eventually took over the publisher role. Um, right. Martha dropped out when she had her kid. I think that was 2003. Right. Right. And went on to do like documentary work. She does some really interesting documentary. Mm -hmm. Some of the martial arts that, that are quite uh, uh, informative, um, great windows and stuff. Um, <laughs> got the job, you know, actually uh, I had been writing for uh, all the magazines back then, you know, Black Belt mm -hmm. All the all the various like any place I could write, um, yeah. And uh, it was I was almost kind of headhunted out. Um, a lot of it was uh, Andy Ching, who used to be mm -hmm. he's he, he's a big foot god guy, and he uh, was part of Tire Claws, one of their sales reps. And uh, I, I kind of hit the bamboo ceiling at Wing Lam at the time, um, and, and so. You know, it was just time to move on. And I, I moved on with his blessing. We, we had a, a, you know, a good heart to heart about it. He was, he was actually one of the things I, I really am grateful for is that Wing Lam was very uh, laissez-faire. You know, he wasn't very possessive of his students, I think, because he had right. multiple masters. He was all like, yeah, go out, train with other people, you know, make it work. You know, it, it, he wasn't. Like, oh, you only train with me and that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, and, and so I always had a lot of freedom. So you took the opportunity. So there's two things there, though. One is you took the opportunity to change jobs from working for Wing Lam Enterprises, right, yeah. to working for Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine. And yeah. the second was being the student, right, to yeah. then train in Shaolin or other styles through the magazine. I assume meeting all those Sifus through the magazine. Or did you have a, a, a Sifu of mine that you wanted to learn from? Um, well, actually, I went to, to so Shaolin at once. Or I left uh, Wing Long. <laughs> um, I went to my first trip to Shaolin was 1995. And I okay. brought a lot of that curriculum back to Wing Long with his blessing, of course. And uh, I, I don't, I left around 99, 2000. I mean, I was still kind of going, but it, it got really awkward uh, dynamic wise, not so much with Wing Lam, but with the other students. Um, mm. so, Cause I was like, I was the head Shaolin instructor, but then I, I kind of wasn't, but I was still kind of there, but I was working with this other company and some people thought of that as a betrayal and it just got uncomfortable. Yeah. And so, mm. um, and so I moved on. Plus I, I moved physically. And so I was farther from where that school 
And okay. there was a bunch of, I mean, it was kind of, I mean, perhaps you have the same situation being a publisher and that, and, and a producer of, of, of martial arts content where you had to be kind of choosy about who you actually take lessons from because not oh, only yeah. a teacher student relationship, but you don't want to be with a teacher that's going to kind of use you. Right. It's, you know, and, and of course, I mean, we, we promote our masters and their material because it's what's fresh in our right. mind. But um, yeah, at the same time, you don't want somebody who's just, you know, just oh, put me on the cover, put me on the cover, you know, or what? Right. Write my book. It's like, eh. uh, so, um, I know it well. Yeah, I'm sure. And so, <laughs> I, I, you know, I bounced yeah. through a, a few different places till I, I found some people I could work with. And it was kind of weird because. In the Bay Area, there was such a shifting landscape of mm. mainland Chinese martial arts people who would come over, and uh, invariably they would like their school would get big enough where they could bring some more people over, you know. And then those people, as soon as they got their green card, they were out of there with all the students they taught. And then, then mm -hmm. school, and then they were only like down like three blocks, you know, not far. And so it was kind of this weird sort of feudal, feudal. A community where people were connected in all sorts of different ways and forming, reforming, schools are opening, closing, so many strip mall schools. Um, we had so many mainlanders come over and, you know, all these guys to come over on a, a special skills uh, visa. Right. You got to have some special skills. So they all, they were right. all talented. They're almost all at least, you know, municipal level champions. Which in China means you've bested millions of people, right? Right, right. Yeah, sure. it, it, it's yeah, it got kind of crazy, um, and it was always shifting. But uh, you know, I, I found my way. It was, I had a, a, some good, some great opportunities, actually. What was the dynamic like with um, the mainland Chinese coming in when there's? probably Cantonese, Toysan, Hong Kong people, mostly, I assume, in the Bay Area of Chinese. But, you know, That's... it's always been kind of tense, especially at the tournaments. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> I remember one of my last competitions being, they, they like collapsed all the, all the advanced forms down. And I took third place, beaten by a guy doing Zuichuan, you know, drunken wushu. And, and, a, and a gal doing chan chuan, basically. Gotcha. And I was just like, you know, Come on. this is supposed to be a traditional ring. And I got beaten by right. a drunken this woman. Actually, I and the, beat me all the time. But, you know, yeah. um, and so I think a lot of the traditionalists really rejected that and pulled back from the tournaments, which was kind of the wrong way to go. You should have doubled in, you know. If there was, I mean, if there were the students to the, do it, the problem, the ultimate problem was in, in the judging in that. Yeah. St and this is still a pervasive problem, you know, with the tournament that we put on with tire claw, getting judges to see the difference between traditional and modern wushu and right. sure they get categorized. And, you know, certainly a lot of the wushu, modern wushu athletes are physically very, very strong, very athletic. And so they can make their forms, you know, look more appealing in right. a situation. It was designed for competition, whereas traditional Kung Fu, you know, can kind of look awkward because it's not designed to be right. performance necessarily. Um, so, yeah, that's complicated. I mean, all the tournaments in here in our area really struggle to maintain their traditional rings. Mm -hmm. but it's been a it's been a, a battle that I've been waging for, at at Tiger Claw Elite, uh, at the Tiger Claw Elite Championships since its inception. Um, right. This, uh, Daniel Tomazaki does a tournament that's strictly traditional uh, up in Concord area, no wushu at all. And that's lovely, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. th there are other tournament promoters that are local that um, still do a lot of wushu. And, and what makes it really complicated is that. Um, a lot of the generations of the, the new generation, I don't, by new generation, like the last 10 years, you have uh, the uh, people that were produced by uh, the sports colleges and such. And the mm. distinction between what you and I would call traditional versus modern wushu 
is muddier, you know. Um, right. Well, you know, Shaolin Temple presents a crazy problem because they have their curriculum of forms, which can be performed like wushu, you know, like you could do Shaolin Chuan at a, you know, at an aerial in here and there, you know, and do it real snazzy. Or you could do it very traditional, like, you know, like some 70 year old master might do it. It's a right. same form, but it's, it, it's, it's what personality you imbue into it. Right. What mm -hmm. And so that becomes neither fish nor fowl. Right. Um, it, with, with, uh, with Tyre Call Elite, we had to create a special vision specifically for, for, uh, Song Chan Shaolin, uh, curriculum. I mean, mm. God, we did, uh, we did an article on new Shaolin disciples. Uh, and this was meant in like 2000, 2005 or something. We did one and there was like 40 in the area at that point. Wow. And after that, I lost count. You know, I just could not keep track of how many were coming in from Shaolin. And, and so there's a lot. Um, and actually, you know, I'm, I just got pulled into an event happening on November uh, 3rd through 5th in Los Angeles, which we're still kind of sculpting out. So I can't quite, I'm a little bit under NDA for that, but uh, it's going to be a major Shaolin event. Um, now that the pandemic has wow. subsided, subsided enough, um, we're looking at bringing over a troop and uh, bringing over the Abbot. And so wow. we'll see how it all goes, but. That's in development as we speak. In fact, I got to check. A lot out. of times when I see Shaolin on YouTube, or at least guys in monk robes. Right. It looks like Wushu, right? Right. And they could just be Wushu guys in monk robes. You Which know. it often is. And there was yeah. a point where uh, the Beijing uh, Wushu team started adopting like Bang Tui, the, 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 yeah. the laces on your, on, your, uh, on your calves, you know? Yeah. And so it's like... And th there are definitely what they call, you know, Biao Yan Zhang, the, the performance monks. Yeah. Um, they're trying to clean that up. But, I mean, if you're going to put it on stage, it's got to be performance worthy. Right. Yeah, so right. I get that compromise. Um, uh, they're still traditional to be found at Shaolin, but you got to ask for it. And you right. You know it when you see it. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, basically just go to the older masters. Just don't go with the right. Young. But they push the young guys out first because you're a foreign tourist, you know. And you want to see all their athletic and they look ripped and, sure. you know, strong and, you and know. They are. They're in <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The uh, Shaolin Temple in Quanzhou, the, the official artists are Mao Chou Kun or Wu Zhu Chuan, right? Mm -hmm. And they do it all wushu style -y. Oh, really? You know, taking their hands extra and the stances are real long and wide and... Um, and it's just like, come on, it's annoying on. That's because you see where the art just spread out and became long, long arm instead of short hand, you know, it became hmm. long and wushu -y and deep stances and stuff that's not in the, you know, <laughs> the twin yeah. pool. So uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. It's a pervasive problem. But I mean, I think, I think I, I, I don't feel that traditional Gong Fu is really that threatened. Um, when you get older, you can't do that. You know? right. And so you've got to, if you're going to stay with the practice, and a lot of people don't, but if you can stay with the practice, you've got to go traditional at some point, you know, like right. your 30s, get in your 40s. If you really want to keep this up, you're not going to be busting 720s. you got to right. find those traditional arts. And that therein, I think, is very much the power of Chinese martial arts. I mean, you know, Tai Chi is the most, you know, I, I still, I'll have these breakthrough moments where it's like, oh yeah, this is the brilliant way to train when your body's getting older. You know, I yeah. can only work on some concepts here that, um, you know, that aren't, that aren't going to break a joint, you know, that right. aren't, aren't, I'm not going to get sprained, you know, but I can still do some serious work uh, for my body as it is now being older, you know, and I, I find that in a lot of, uh, well, like we were talking about Hunga earlier, um, things like iron wire, you can carry that to, I see guys like in their eighties doing iron wire. Oh yeah. To, uh, 
Ducal was like what, 100 something and he was still oh, yeah so oh. ripped incredible yeah. but i mean yeah, yeah so it's it, a golf was kind of it's for the longer game which i think gets complicated in, in you know our, in our youth driven modern society where you know you don't think about how hard it might be to fight when you're you know in your 50s 60s i mean we can't all be helio gracie right you know i mean you've got to have a longer game you know and uh right uh, there and i think lies one of the the true gems of the chinese styles that and mm-hmm. crazy weapons I mean, and then the weapons yeah we, right weapon. i want to know that you know that's what it's all about getting the getting the students to buy you dim sum to learn the secrets you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've always had a fascination uh, growing up with with the old masters, you know, mm. and and like just from watching Shaw Brothers and, sure. and all that kind of stuff and the Kung Fu TV series, you know, yeah. and it's like the guys with the beards, you know, the old and they're in there doing stuff and they're teaching the young guys and they're still beating them up with two moves. And, right, right. and it's just like and I always thought, you know, as as a. You don't believe it, but I'm a white guy, right? You, you can't tell. <laughs> but as a white guy outside the culture looking in, right? In my sure. whole, you know, for age nine, my whole basically those formative years of what is martial arts about was going to the local Chinese restaurant and eating and thinking there's, you know, the cooks in the back are doing Kung Fu between meals, <laughs> right? I worked at Asian World of Martial Arts, and I knew there was monkey boxing in the basement. There wasn't, wow. and uh, you know, <laughs> and every old Asian guy I ever saw, I knew he was a master because on the movies they all are, you know. Right. And they, yeah. But, yeah. If, but I always was impressed when I did meet, you know, as I got older and I was meeting different masters and sifus and grandmasters that how how well they were still able to walk and move and communicate and do techniques at an old age. Yeah, in, and in the Philippines, it was same thing with the escrimadors, the guys who were really doing it their whole life. When they're eighty years old, they're still they're not as fast as the young guys at all. But their timing was so perfect, they get in between the moves. You know, yeah. it's like a different skill level over time. Just like the kung fu master would turn seven degrees and hit you, but the young guy has to step out of the way and parry to do the same move. Yeah, it's, it's like a refinement of technique. It's so much about their ability to be economical and, yeah you know really i mean i'm always impressed by the the older masters you know especially the mm-hmm. older I mean, you know i always fantasized about like you know yoda right that that whole right totally like, yoda's it ancient master and uh yeah um and when you actually encounter these guys it's just because you know it's not about physicality you know not at all sometimes there's guys that are just big and can throw you around because they're just big or they're just fast or they're just right. flexible. They've got some sort of physical skill that makes them, you know, able to beat you much easier. But then you get these old guys, all that's gone. And it's just the skill. It's just the pure yes. Kung Fu. And that's, yep. um, th- th- those are the people that I want to like, uh, you, I want to follow you. Teach me, you know, teach right. me and get that. You know? Yeah. Teach so, me the way there. Right. How and, did you, um, your Shaolin teacher, mm-hmm. um, did you meet him in, what was it, 95 or 7 when you made your 95? Did you meet him at that time and became a student then? Um, and you have the same teacher through or did I, something? I met, How did that come? In 95, I discipled under him in 96. And okay. um, at first it was kind of a like a token discipleship. I mean, there weren't that many shaolin disciples and i just kind of wanted that credit by my name and you know i had the opportunity um but over the years it's become uh uh a very traditional disciple i was i was fortunate i mean i i, I had a real i felt a real connection with him uh see the tongue from the beginning um he, he's he was one of the earlier monks that were sent out to tour the world and one of his guang fu's is that he's just um very affable, very easygoing, very charismatic, and, you know, speaks a little bit of a lot of languages. So I remember one time we were training on Songshan, and uh, 
there was this other student that spoke French. Um, and then, then there was another student that spoke, uh, was it Tagalog or something? And, and we were all kind of trying to communicate because we were training together with these moves. And then we get something and we try to, you know, so we had to bounce through English or our broken Mandarin or, or what little French I know. And uh, it, it was really kind of wacky, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a great kind of cross-cultural sharing. Um, when I've gone to Shaolin, there have been times when my teacher have not has not been there because he was on the road doing seminars or something mm-hmm. and so with other people, you know. Um, but, you know, I always try to seek to try to train with him. And prior to the pandemic, one of his, uh, there's a monk in this area, former monk, um, uh, he uh, was very well connected to um, to the tongue, and so he was hosting him at his school, and I was of course supporting that, bringing other students in, and that kind of uh, what was it uh, year of the pandemic, uh, nine, 2019 was it uh, was the twentieth anniversary of his school, the tongue school. So all the disciples and all the students were going to go back, but pandemic happened and fell apart. Uh, I, I haven't seen him since the pandemic. We've exchanged a few emails. Um, hopefully he'll hit the road again soon. He started to travel a little more, you know, he, he just opened up a, a school, another brick and mortar, uh, in China. Wow. So I, I, I don't know where he's at right now. We'll see, you know, hopefully he'll be able to come over again soon. And some of that will resume. I mean, it feels like it's starting to open up again, particularly yeah. when, Chinese uh, masters coming over and people going into China. Um, yeah, it's, a, right. it's, it's, it's slowly coming back. I mean, um, watching the Shaw brothers movies growing up, you know, all the guys at the Shaolin temple did Hunga you know, because Lao Gar Lung, you know, was the choreographer, right. And he's a Hung stylist. Sure. So I was always confused growing up, uh, you know, and then they'd call it like Sulem, Hungar, you know, and you're like, wait, Shaolin Hungar, and they're doing Hungar at the Shaolin Temple in the in the um, Master Killer, 36 Chambers of Kung Fu, right. you know, like, so, and then when I see Shaolin people, people in Shaolin uniforms on YouTube, they're doing Wushu, most of them, so my yeah. question is, at, at this point, I'm still trying to figure out, is Shaolin, Shaolin Temple Kung Fu the same as it's not the same as Bax Yulam because you you already said it's different curriculum, and it's yep. not Wushu, right? Yeah. Uh, so what are the old, uh, and it's not the Hungar from the movies. So right. what is what is the characteristic of it? Because when I have the books on the Shaolin Temple, it all looks like Wushu moves except for the training, which looks pretty hardcore. Um, yeah. So if you could kind of describe maybe some of the characteristics of it, or well, how it's maybe similar or different from Northern. Well, Bok Silom, Northern Shaolin, but you it's know, not Shaolin. I've actually shown the Bok Silom forms to uh, several Shaolin monks, and they all give it a big thumbs up. They're all like, you know, that is definitely a Shaolin set. It's not one that we know. Okay. But you can see the looks and chops of it. Um, that it, 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 you know, like one of the key things is that, you know, that warrior stands at the end. You know, the Lohan pose. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, but there are other kind of signatures within the form that, you know, it just, it feels, it feels right to them, you know, that they, they've all acknowledged it. Um, and people that I know that know both systems or have dabbled in both systems find a, find a, a connection. You know, I think mm-hmm. I would be able to progress within the Shaolin, the Songchan Shaolin forms more rapidly than some of my other people, uh, my other fellow travelers at the time because of having that background. And, you know, keep in mind that a lot of the other people that I was traveling with were, uh, um, you know, champions in their own style. I mean, there was one guy that, you know, made, made his living uh, as, as a no holds barred fighter kind of prior to the whole wow. UFC boom, you know. Um, he was doing that. What was that thing they used to do in, 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 in Japan? Shoot fighting, was it? But anyway. Oh, yeah. They were, yeah. Yeah. So, they had shoot though. Right, shoot fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so um, uh, there's definitely a connection. Um, there is a body, a core curriculum of forms 
uh, that uh, are heavily circulated at Shaolin, um, Xiaohong Chuan, you know, Lohan Chuan, and, and these are fairly consistent. Um, right now, there's an attempt for Shaolin to uh, codify, like they always do in China, and so they've just right. they've established their own Duan system, their own level system, and their own forms that go with it, which are new forms, sort of recombination of the old forms. They also, several years ago, they did this whole thing where they set up competition forms that were, again, mm. dominant of old forms. Um, but then there's this core of, of old forms that uh, are still being uh, practiced. And then the, there's all this crazy stuff. I mean, like, I think one of the craziest things is uh, soccer, right? Yeah. Taco is like the biggest school uh, in the world. Hey, Stephen Chen, right? Shaolin Soccer. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Chow, Stephen Chow. But, um, Stephen Chow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, Tago, you know, when I was first reporting on them, they had like, you know, 18,000 live-in students. The last number I got out of them just prior to the pandemic was like 30,000 live-in students. Oh. It's crazy. It's so huge. Um, but they teach everything. And one of the things they picked up was uh, soccer. And now they're teaching soccer because, you know, China desperately wants to break into the international soccer game. They've been wow. plucking major uh, soccer players, putting them on these Chinese teams. Uh, that, you know, I mean, it's a big face thing for China to be able to conquer so many sports. And they right. a lot of sports, right? I mean, um, you're not going to get close to the Chinese and a lot like gymnastics. You know, a lot of the other sports, they're all over it. Soccer is one of the ones they really want to get. So Shaolin soccer is being trained at Shaolin. So one of the weirdest recursive, you know, you got the movie that came out and the, 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 right. the, then the reality starts reflecting the movie, which very much so is uh, uh, an element in Shaolin temple now. I mean, had it not been for Jet Li's movie, it probably could have stayed in ruins for, for you know, until now. I mean, that's what really brought the attention back. Oh yeah, he built it and bloomed up, it, and it bloomed again. Um, but I mean, you can find I, I, there's like cardio kickboxing there. Um, there's all because there's so many schools, and they all right. have, offer things that are competitive. I mean, the, 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 what is Shaolin Kung Fu? There's definitely a core, but yeah. there's the Wushu, and then there's the Sanda, and then there's the Taekwondo, and then there's all these yeah. other different things. The soccer. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and in some ways that, that fits in the myth that we've always perpetuated that Shellen was this academy where all these, you know, renegades or rebels would go and, and, you know, find sanctuary, try to take refuge, but then they would teach their skills. And that's how Shellen becomes at this academy that it is because everybody brings all these different skills into it. Now it's just on a global level, so uh -huh. you know, it, it, it's. I mean, it's hard, it's still hard for me to get my mind around it, and I've been actively researching it since 1995, since I first went. You know, there's yeah. so many stories, so many. Uh, it's just so much. You know, it's such a wealth of of martial arts, and you know, a lot of people that are, are critical of it. You got to go there, and you got to go there and dig. Because if you just go there and be a tourist, you know, just like any tourist situation, you know, you're not going to get past the, the, the tchotchkes they're trying to sell you. But uh, right. but if you uh, if you dig, there's incredible roots there. There's so many resources, you know, and uh, and I find that that's also sort of inspiring. Like Wudangshan and other Hermeshan, they're all other other martial uh, communities are selling mm -hmm. legacy once more which is, you know, exciting after the Cultural Revolution where everything kind of got stopped on for a couple of years. So, yeah. For cool. people like us, and there's, you know, when when you get stuck into martial arts and you can't get out, you know, like the mob, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're your own mob boss. Yeah. You're like, you let yourself in, you won't let yourself go out. Everybody keeps pulling you back in. Even you take a break, you get pulled back in. But we get to a point where it's like uh, a lot of us, but there's not enough where you just want to know everything. So you start to be in, in the old days, it was the books, you know, now we've got YouTube, but yeah. like finding an old manual, 
You know, I mean, I go to New York Chinatown and I just go through all the old bookstores and they had two of my books, uh, my teacher's book and one of my Filipino books in a bookstore in Chinatown, New York with the old 795 price on it instead of nice. 2495 as they print them now. And it was like just sitting in the shelf next to all the textbooks and, you know, and then, oh, look, a Tai Chi Tao book. The pictures are so cool. The guy in the pictures looks really good not line yeah. drawings or some fake wushu and you know oh 495 you know i'll take it and you just want to and i think that's that's why i got into the writing and the researching and the interviewing was because mm-hmm. i wanted to learn so much more and i wanted to meet all the old teachers right yeah. and the best way to become to learn stuff from them without having to buy c or become a disciple or a student is to interview them and talk to them and uh, you know, get all the stories across all the teachers, um, and that's how why I started. Right at first, it was just buying, getting all the books, and then, you know, yeah, starting I mean, the research. My, my motivations were very similar, although I think a lot of it was a reaction. I mean, I, my first article was uh, 90, 1991. I did a piece for Inside. Eighty one. Ninety one. Oh, ninety one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, it was more reaction to the quality of stuff that was being published because it was really low right. level back then. You know, the yeah. books, you know, you get like a couple story about uh, two pages on Shaolin Temple, a little page on their lineage, and then we're we're in the form and we're just showing it. Right. It's like okay, that's. Mm. And then Not even though a lot of the magazines just felt light, and so um, I started writing, and then I, I, it was more. I, I came to that same conclusion that you just mentioned in that, well, I can really get to some people. I can ask questions that, you know, you wouldn't ordinarily be able to ask. Yeah. And because you got credibility, you have this magazine right. behind you, right? Right. And, and people want to share, you know, they want to, I mean, of course they're putting their, they're putting on a mask because they want to show well. Right. Right. And, and I, I want them to show well, you know, I'm not out to, to bust anybody or anything. I mean, if they're, if they're, if they're a fraud, I would, wouldn't be interviewing them anyway, you know, or right. with those guys, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, you know, it's kind of funny that you bring up that Godfather analogy because when, uh, when the pandemic hit and, and comfort Tai Chi went down, I mean, we, the writing had been on the wall for a while, you know, I mean, for niche magazines on the newsstand, it was oh, yeah. so hard. And when the newsstand shut down from the shelter in place, you know, we were done. And in a way, I'm grateful that we could we could be finished and not lose face. Everybody understands the pandemic. You know, people are asking, are you going to bring it back? And we're like, no, you know, niche magazines kind of are done. Yeah. Um, but um, so, yeah, I was like, mm, OK, I, when I was when I left after I took my vows as a, as a disciple of Shallow Temple, you know, the monks got around me and said, okay, you know, your mission is bring Shaolin Kung Fu to the West, to the United States. And I felt I'd kind of done that, you know, and I right. felt, felt I fulfilled that goal and I was ready to just, you know, I would still have my practice, but leave the martial world professionally and, uh, you know, just work at a pot dispensary or something. I mean, I live in right. the beach, man. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is a century old beach bungalow that I live in. Um, so, uh, Oh really? Is that where you are? Okay. Uh, so, nice. You know, it's, uh, but then, uh, a lot is of the first floor, your pot dispensary on the first floor. <laughs> if only. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I live in Santa Cruz and you cannot throw a rock and not hit a tattoo parlor or a pot dispensary yeah. or, or, or a brewery and beer brewery just everywhere. But yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, then a, a bunch of people reached out to me from the martial arts community, um, uh, which was incredibly gratifying. Uh, David Rapianzi from um, yeah, AA, YMAA, and, and he, he had a position for me. Um, the, the, like I mentioned, Five Branches Institute reached out. Although that didn't work out in the end, it was uh, something. It was helpful because it got me through some period. A period. Uh, Den of Geek reached out. UNESCO mm-hmm. reached. out. It was, it was really, uh, it's great really gratifying, you know, kind of like seeing your book in a, in a, an old bookstore, you kind of like, Oh yeah, right. this, wow. That's a level of acceptance. I didn't 
anticipate. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's very reaffirming. Um, and it's good now. Like I'm on LinkedIn. You know, when I look at LinkedIn, I see like you're posting. Here's my latest article for Den of Geek. Here's my latest article for YMAA. And I'm like, yeah, Gene's still writing, man. That's <laughs> that's great. Or doing video chats, you know, yeah. uh, stuff. Yeah, that's a that's more challenging, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I tend to think better when I'm writing because I can control what I'm saying. Well, you've got time to think and control and mold this stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. But I think more people are consuming their content on video these days or audio, yeah. and it's hard to the amount of hours it takes to write a good thousand word martial art article, like a really good one, is sure. so. It, it, it you're going to hit so few people with it you know right, right. um you know even on our web tumbuli media my company our mm -hmm. website um i have to put a video or on top of an article to get you know so because people aren't mm -hmm. probably read what's below it uh, yeah. anymore where we used to before i put it out and with a couple of pictures five or eight hundred words or seven hundred words and like a right. whole bunch of clicks and now i put it out and there's nothing and then i put a video on top of it that, you know, and then it's like people are watching the video and then they're like, hey, that's cool. And then they're reading the the, the stuff below it. Yeah. And it's like, man. <laughs> and, the, you know, the other big thing that's been happening, I don't know if you're getting this, but uh, um, I'm getting about an, an article a week that's definitely AI produced. And, yeah. I mean, I can smell them just because they're written like bad Wikipedia pages and clearly yeah. by people that have not really engaged our, you know, our writings that they've, they've asked, you know, write an article about Kung Fu, you know, right. At the same time I've, I've had, there was a guy on our forum on Kung Fu magazine.com as well as, um, David Silver, who's the, the, uh, the video guy at YMAA, uh, among other things, uh, asked, uh, both of them came up with some phenomenal articles that were AI generated because they knew just oh. to ask. Right. right, they knew how to ask the question. Right. Yeah. So, and I don't, I, I don't know that I'm op opposed to writing an AI written article. I just want to run a good, run good articles. Right. You know? um, and so far, all, all the AI ones are really bad. Yeah. <laughs> really bad, you know, well, they're like, grabbing. They're, they're not. You know, when you go into Chat GPT. You know, I tried a bunch just to see how it would come out. And it's always spitting out about the same length with bullet points and different things. Right. Um, but I feel like it's all, it's just, I mean, and it's so fast. I don't even know how it, 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 it pulls it through that fast. But it's yeah. a nice synopsis of, of what's out there. But it's also pulling from wrong information, right? Yeah. It's not pulling from firsthand sources or second. It's right, pulling right. from all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't even read. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. you have a fascination with swords and you started making swords, right? Uh, so did you actually like, you know, you have your iron, your hammer and stick it in the hot coals and all I've, that, or I've never more like a forge. Um, what happened was, um, when I got out of school, um, some of my, one of my dear old friends and teammates, had worked for this company, American Fencer Supply, that predominantly did, you know, fencing equipment for the sport of fencing, but also for mm -hmm. also. And um, so he, he, he got me a job there. Um, they had a armory department. And that grew off of kind of an interesting um, thing. What happened was uh, somebody, you know, we, we always, being a fencing company, they'd sold, you know, trophy swords or little wall hangers. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we expressly said, don't use these. These are, it's pot metal, they'll break. But somebody um, used one in some play and a piece of sword broke and a piece flew out into the orchestra pit and scratched somebody's oh, man. thing. And so it was a big issue. Um, but at some point, uh, some people at the company said, well, you know, um, why can't we build uh working weapons that are that are strong that can hold up to the rigor yeah. of the actual combat. And so um we use sort of the technology, if you will, of fencing how fencing weapons are assembled, which is basically they're all screwed together. 
you know. And it turned out that a lot of the blade suppliers that we were working with were previously weapon suppliers. And so they had, or sword suppliers, or also huh. uh, did um, like uh, military swords. Uh, there was one of the companies that we worked with had this beautiful catalog of military swords from all over the world. Wow. Today. And so um, we got blades from them because they were still able to make these blades. We mount them in various fittings that we had cast. Sometimes we did a little bit of uh, 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 welding and metal bending, metal shaping. Uh, but we mm -hmm. all had blades, and we found. And as this progressed, we found more and more blade suppliers, um, different kinds of blades to make different kinds of stuff, and uh, created the guard. So technically, it would be what sometimes was called a cutler, not a not a blacksmith or or a metalsmith. But somebody who assembles the uh, okay. the the parts of you know it was really it wasn't as as romantic as hidden right the, that red hot piece of metal it was more like sitting with a Dremel and cleaning up the, cleaning out the flash off some guard that we had cast or something or or, or shaping mm -hmm. shaping a piece of wood to make a handle um, right but the main thing was we we made these weapons kind of um, I mean they had real blades tempered steel. Um, and they were components, so if something like broken production, which often happened, um, we could, you know, FedEx them something, a replacement, right. put it up, put it back on. Also, they were basic. I mean, we could take them to high polish, but we, they, we let the, the theater companies, you know, do what they want to adorn it, you know. And right. Them. And that, uh, at that point, it actually had a decent market because there was nothing else like that. And there's a lot of people doing stuff like Shakespeare, which requires, you know, sword fights. That's mm -hmm. plays, you know, um, I mean, and it got weird too, because like, I mean, like I, I did, I did some swords for Alistair Crowley, who was the, the not Alistair Crowley, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, oh, I just blocked on his name, the uh, head of the uh, Church of Satan here in, in, that was in San Francisco. It'll come to me, but he wrote the Satanic Bible. <laughs> um, I did a lot of pieces for belly dancers, uh, wow. because belly dancers often do, will do a sword dance, right? Uh -huh. And we had a castane, which is a kind of a kind of uh, saber, a Middle Eastern saber that they like all a Persian love. saber or something. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. And um, it, it was a kind of a wall hanger piece. I mean, it was the the blade wasn't tempered steel; you could just bend it and it would stay bent. Um, but the belly dancers loved it and they always wanted them notched in a certain way. So when they balance it on their head, oh, it, can st it would stay, it would stick. It was easy for them to do their wiggling. And so I did a lot of belly dancers. That was pretty fun. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it did a lot of Ren Faire stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think at that point there was nobody really doing it. And now that market is, is, there's so many people making swords now, which just boggles my mind, you know, it's some real high quality stuff, which is, I used cool. to get the museum rep museums, replica catalog with all right. the, uh, from, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was, yeah. That was a fun catalog. Now there's, you know, so many companies that are importing swords, China right. delivering some amazing stuff. Yeah. yeah. People like LK Chen and some of the other, I think it's like art of fire and iron, a couple other companies that are, you know, the, these, uh, I mean, beautifully forged steel. And uh, I, I cut with some of it. Cuts really well. Nice. Nice. In fact, I've got an LK Chen piece like right here under my, in case, in case the ninjas attack, I've got like one of these. Right. Things, which oh, is, sweet. Look at that. It's beautiful. Uh, well, you probably can't see it, but it's beautiful uh, pattern welded steel. See that. Okay. Maybe you can. Look at that. But it's a nice little, uh, you have to cut with this one. It's a really nice one. It's basically like a, a it's, it's, it's a machete, really. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. No, it's actually pretty light, actually. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. It looks sturdy anyway from here. Yeah. It's, sturdy. it's well made. It's solid. I keep thinking I should mm -hmm. bring it because it's a little, the handle's a little blocky, but um, the blade is, you know, blade is good. <laughs> How does somebody go from uh, traditional kung fu and fencing and 
assembling swords and be, being an editor and a publisher and a writer to de-escalating psychedelic trips at concerts. Let's how would that tell. No, actually, that's a martial arts story. Um, I okay. Was training, I was training Yaido with uh, Sensei Steve Anderson, who was by day a professional psych tech. And he was one of the oh. founders of the, uh, the uh, psych program of uh, this organization called Rock Medicine, which was mm -hmm. part of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. Okay. And, um, you know, now, now it's, you know, Rock Medicine is still going. In fact, uh, tomorrow <laughs> night, I leave for Outside Lands to work for Rock Medicine, uh, wow. Medicine which is a big music festival we do here in Golden Gate Park. Um, but... Uh, so Steve knew at that point I was a deadhead. He knew I was deadhead. Um, today's actually, you know, Jerry's death day too. The end of days between, uh, which mm. is my, my grateful day color. Oh, there you go. Um, um, yeah. So he knew I was a deadhead. So he knew I was street smart. He knew I knew a lot of restraint techniques, and he knew also that I was um, in a, a PhD program for uh, um, psychology. Although I was uh, I mean, not therapeutic stuff, but he invited me to work a show, and that first show was uh, uh, U2's Joshua Tree tour. Oh no, I, kidding! Um, at that point, I was kind of passingly aware of U2. Right, such an amazing show! It really blew me away, and I was hooked. And I've been part of the industry now for uh, I guess this is year thirty six. Yeah, and, um, I. Uh, you know, I, I was on hired to be on tour with the Grateful Dead. I was on tour with uh, Fish. Nice. I work a lot of reggae festivals. I've worked for multiple organizations now because That's uh, terrific. It, it's really. It did kinda, you finish the PhD program? I did not. I followed the Grateful Dead. See, <laughs> that's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> who needs uh, who needs a, a doctorate? You know? <laughs> Yeah, I think Kesey said, Ken Kesey said, sometimes you got to skip a little school to further your education. That's right. And I took that to heart. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah. I, I, it turns out I'm not a scientist. You know, I, I thought I was. But uh, yeah. And actually what I was studying um, was difference, differences between experts and novices. So there was, hmm. at the time, a lot of research um, looking at chess masters and how they think and how they memorize, how they, you know, how, the, how their memory goes. And uh, yeah, they always used to say fencing is the physical chess. So springing off of that, I was seeing if I could apply these same theories to fencing masters. Right. Uh, the problem was that chess is a very distinct, you know, board and can be rendered very symbolically, whereas fencing is motion. And so there's this whole level that I couldn't address in that question right. that kind of jammed me up. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a shame actually, because that would have been this, my original plan was to become an academic and right. uh, that was that, mine as well. Yeah. And that uh, really, that's, yeah. and then we both wound up writing for pop. Yeah. Things, I was so. going to be an anthropologist and a professor. And then you realize when I graduated from college with a degree in, applied sociology and a minor in medical anthropology, there's no jobs and nobody's, there's uh -huh. nothing to do but teach. And there were so many really skilled PhDs from Ivy League colleges working adjunct at four and five colleges just to make yeah. a living. Thank yeah. God Tuttle Publishing called me right as I graduated and said, come to Japan and be our editor. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Cause I had already, I think I, I definitely published one book with them while I was in college. And then mm. I think the second one was on their desk when their editor was leaving to become a lawyer, go to law school. And he oh. called me up and said, we want you to come out and work in Tokyo. And I was like, I'm what? there. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? So yeah. And then yeah. that led to, Another thing and another thing, and here I am. I minored in anthropology, in cultural anthropology, yeah. and in retrospect, I should have majored in it and yeah. looked at martial arts. Because, yeah. But I think in some ways our generation was a little early because it's happening now. We're seeing a lot of right. analysis. Looking in martial arts, yeah. Awesome. You know, and then looking mm -hmm. at cultural perform uh, phenomena, uh, right. uh, doing some really in-depth scholarly 
work. You know, some of the stuff that's coming out of University of Hawaii Press. Just, oh, oof. University of Hawaii has always been good for that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, um, everyone, you know, there's been a lot of really good, um, well-researched books, which has been tremendously exciting. I'm sure you have the same. Right. You know, but I think that's been it's only been like the last ten years or so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so a little bit before our time man <laughs> yeah i was yeah. interested in you know ritual processes rites of initiation mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, magical shamanism all kinds of stuff like that um and using the anthropological method to deconstruct patterns of behavior and movement patterns of different cultures and um you know it was and and so right at the time i was at tuttle I also became an editor at uh, Journal of Asian Martial Arts, which was the first academic publication for martial right. arts. And, right. you know, there was just no readers, you know. I mean, beautiful yeah. publication, a very small readership. It was too soon. Like you're saying, it was too soon. Yeah. And um, I was going to go to NYU for a master's degree in, in anthropology and writing about martial culture across mm -hmm. different cultures. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, no, nobody cares, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up going to Japan instead uh, yeah. and working for Tuttle. But, you know, I wanted to do documentaries on fighting styles from around the world, like a Don Drager, but with a video. And, sure. you know, uh, didn't didn't quite do that. But um, well, you're kind just of interesting. Doing it now. <laughs> What's that? You're kind of doing it now. Yeah, yeah. kind of doing it now. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know mid fifties doing it. <laughs> you want me to do it in my twenties. Uh, you know, what's interesting though, is I, especially in the Philippine arts, I did a ton of research going over to Asia, Philippines 22 times or something and up yeah. and down the islands, interviewing all the teachers and stuff. And I think all but one have passed away. It's like a whole generation that I documented are now gone. And mm -hmm. the new art today doesn't look like the old art because of YouTube. Everybody's got, Crombit and grappling and BJJ in it and all kinds of stuff because they're all competing for marketing and sure. all the system names have changed even though all these 20 guys had went the same teacher but now it's 20 yeah. new styles out there and yeah. it's just it's just insane but yeah. I'm thinking about taking all the archive footage I shot tens of thousands of photos and videos and and making little documentaries about each of those old masters that have passed um, that would be awesome yeah and I also have it for Kung Fu and Silat and Indian Salambam and Marma Adi. And I mean, I was going around, you know. Yeah. And I, yeah. Was, I didn't know nobody cared. <laughs> you know? I thought everybody cared about this stuff, Gene. And then yeah. you realize, like, yeah, even the martial artists don't care. There's just a very small silo of people, crazy people like us who go deep, you know. Yeah. Or yeah. trying well, to put this stuff. Growing. I think. Uh... I think it's it's been sort of this, it's sort of a, uh, I mean, sort of a parasitical relationship in that you know right. you need good stuff to be out there for people right. to want good stuff, and now there's right. more good stuff coming out, so there's more people that are are, mm -hmm. are, are more literate, if you will. Uh, I mean, the internet's right. been fantastic for sharing, where you right. know, be able to find these little cliques of people that are, you know, interested in stuff. I mean, I think so. I, I used to pay for a lot of my trips to China by importing antique swords because, you, mm. you know, when I was first going, the dollar versus the, the, the yuan was really strong and I could pick up, and you know, these are like ancient antiques, these are like Republic of China, maybe. Like Qing Dynasty stuff? Not, no, Republic of China, it was like you know, just prior to the Cultural Revolution, really. Right, maybe right. 100 years old, right? Some of it was probably fake, but, you know, um, but you could pick a little species <laughs> for 20 bucks, turn them around for 200, wow. 300 bucks, you know, I'd, I'd go yeah. Rifle case and pack it full of weapons before nine eleven, um, right? And, uh, you know, back then there was no resources for uh, for Chinese weapons. You know, I mean, there was right. Yang Jiaming's book, Ancient Chinese Weapons. That was really it in English. Yeah, uh, even in Chinese, there wasn't very much. But now, I mean, on the internet, man, I, I'm on all these groups, and people are showing examples of weapons and museums or in their collection. And um, that's just incredibly exciting. I mean, yeah.
Uh, perhaps you remember in, in Tome for Tai Chi, we, we had a, a monthly, uh, or every issue had uh, the featured weapon, which was some antique piece. Nice. Some of them were not as antique as others, but uh, um, it was, uh, I felt it was really important um, for Kung Fu people to see what Kung Fu weapons look like because right. we never arrived at the sort of design for the Tian and this design for the Dao. That's not what they all look like. It's what some look like. And right. there's actually quite a lot of diversity in those types of swords. Um, and, you know, I, that's great. That's so exciting. And that uh, is exciting. Um, it, it, in fact, uh, I, I work, uh, I, I'm on the programming committee at the uh, uh, Chinese Historical Society of America, which is a intimate little museum in uh, Chinatown, just uh, uh, or just on the edge of Chinatown. Um, right now we have this Bruce Lee display going and we are planning to stage a weapons exhibit, which uh, one of my, uh, one of my Sibop, one of my comfortable uncles, uh, he has a magnificent collection of mm. stuff that, some of the stuff that has been shown in uh, museums and such. Um, but uh, in fact, he even armed uh, Chug and Fat for uh, that uh, that Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Uh, ah. but it was actually they took it. They took one that was like a, it was a replica. But it was you know, he's got it in his little display room, his little man cave full of weapons. I tell you, you would go nuts if you went in here because every time oh, I go, man, the guy's got like 300, 400 pieces, you know, and just like all different periods. Some that's really crazy, amazing pieces, and then some other pieces that are. That I think are amazing, but he's like, ah, that's not a great piece. <laughs> You're like, they give it to me. You know I mean? <laughs> We're going to get their exhibit, a museum exhibit, and hopefully that'll come to fruition by the end of the year. Where, you know, uh, we we had some setbacks. We were originally trying to do it before summer, but there was some setbacks. Um, we're hoping that it comes. I mean, to my knowledge, it's the first time that a major exhibit of Chinese weapons has been done in right. the United States. We've certainly had ones for Japanese weapons and of course European weapons. Mm -hmm. but, um, nothing for Chinese weapons. And so mm -hmm. and I've actually seen that there's some now some some museums uh and and uh exhibits happening in Asia, in China mm -hmm. and Hong Kong, which is tremendously exciting. Like um, bringing back the culture, the old culture. Yeah. I mean, I think what happened with a lot of the Chinese weapons is they just all went underground because right. during the Cultural Revolution, everybody had to hide all that stuff. Right. All the immigrants, you know, all the Tong stuff they had to hide. You know, one of uh, one of my old friends, another dearly deceased uh, Kung Fu comrade, uh, Eric Ishii, had this amazing Tao, which had like a... a um, uh, crescent moon hook on it, like a tire soap hook. Oh, oh. beautiful piece! But he got it at an auction in Chinatown, where somebody had like they had cleared out a basement and they found a trunk and it was like chock full of weapons. All oh. that. all got to be Tong stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, it's out there. They're out there, um, and uh, I mean, every time I picked up a real antique. It's a revelation because the balance, the, the feel, balance, is, yeah, you know, and how it actually sits in your hand, um, you know, and then there's that whole kind of legacy. You're holding something, and you're wondering, did this really go kill somebody? You right, know, was right. This, this, you know, you can see like little damage on the edge where it's been in battle, and it's like, uh huh, like hmm, the story is. You're like, what's the angle of that? So what strike did it come into contact with? You know? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the ways you can help identify a genuine weapon from a fake is you look at where the marks are, you know, and if they're true to where you would use them, you know, or whether they're just random, mm -hmm. you know, just buried in their backyard for a couple of months so it got all rusty, yeah. and, you know, look over. You know, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I, I'm excited that that is happening in the Chinese martial arts realm. It's slow because it has to fight modern wufu, and right. you know, if anybody's comp nobody's compromised weapons as much as modern wufu. 
you know. Oh my gosh. They, the swords are just it. wiggling. They're like feathers in the yeah. wind, you know. And I get that uh, whole thing like, where they like they make that popping sound and yeah. that's an expression of fa jing or your energy. But I'm convinced and I, I don't I gotta get somebody with a slow motion camera to do this. Maybe you like maybe you can do this on your side, but uh the reason a weapon pops is because when you when you move accelerate it folds back on itself and then snaps back out again right so we get pop noise but i mean if i'm trying to stab you at that velocity i'm actually folding the tip away and it's not going to yeah. pop into you that's just not the way it works so i'd love right. to I'd take that in like a like a slow motion i don't camera. think the flexible guandals and the flexible you know dial broadswords are usable because yeah, they can't. Exactly. You're going to hit them on the bend. Yeah. yeah exactly. You have to be able to get that. It's like in Kung Fu where you want to get the snap from your, the fudging from your punch without the, the uniform being starched, right? To get the <laughs> fake pop. <laughs> right. You know, you don't need the blade to make the noise. You need your body to make that, that shake. The boom, you know. Right, right. So, like we talked about earlier about the, the five answers for shaking, right? You know, people see that example and then they kind of caricature it. Right. More dramatic. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Right. The point is not to make that drama. The point is to to emit the power. Right. It, and that's in, in the classics, it says that the hands vibrate, not shake. There's a difference when you're using tension to vibrate, right? Because right. like isotonic strength. Sure. Uh, when you're pushing, the hands will vibrate, but you're not waving them. And a lot of guys just go like this, right. and right. it's just right. so, there's nothing happening. You know, it's just fake. It's right. like, well, it says to shake. No, it says vibrate. You know? <laughs> yeah, those are those minor points, right? Yeah, yeah. the minor points is everything, you know. Right. They're everything. Yeah. So what's on the horizon for Gene Ching? So you're, you're currently writing a bunch of articles, and people can find you on LinkedIn and Facebook and YMAA.com. Um, and I'll put all of your contact stuff and all these websites in our show notes oh, for people who are interested. But, yeah. but what's what's uh, brewing aside from the museum thing, which is super awesome? Well, I mean, look, so we have that Shaolin event coming up in, in November, and that's actually November. Immortal Studios, which is a, wow. a comic producer that I huh. that reached out and hired me to choreograph some of their uh, their comics because it's wow. they're, they're all cool. uh, they're all wuxia comics. And yeah, so wanted like real Shaolin Gong Fu. And it was really kind of fun because it was, you know, comics, of course, are like, you know, different cells. Which right. Was a lot like what I did with the magazine to try and describe a movement through photos. And so they, you know, the character, the fight scene would happen and such and such has to happen. And then I'd have to solve that in more Shaolin like techniques. And since there's so, right. you know, those photo books, you know, and resources. Yeah. So working together on that, I just actually. I came back from San Diego Comic Con um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was with Immortal um, doing some uh, announcing this soon to come uh, Shaolin event. So, so that's probably the biggest thing on the horizon. I mean, so, you, like, so that's some pretty interesting stuff, interesting projects going on. This, yeah, I mean, we'll see yeah. what happens with Tire Claws, the Tire Claw League Championships. We're hoping to perpetuate mm -hmm. that, but. Um, this last year was coming out of the, we, we did in May, we did the first tournament we'd done since the pandemic. And, uh, it was a challenge. We had, we had a great turnout. We had more competitors and attendees than ever before. We also wow. had all this staff to handle it. And, um, the budget for everything like rental of the facility hotels, um, like went up three times and wow. we, we had it budgeted for 2019 um so that was challenging there was a lot of challenges in that a lot of the point, point people we work with had all moved on during the pandemic and yeah so without like weird rules of, i mean they're in the contract but our previous people would what would weigh them so one for example was um for a crowd of the magnitude that we would draw for that tournament and we're talking like 2,000 plus people um, wow. We need to have a uh, metal detector at each exit entrance, um, which also needed to be manned by two two people that knew how to use this thing. 
and that was they came at three thousand bucks a pop per day and uh, so when we have a two-day event and we're like well you know you guys should be walking in here with spears and swords and you're gonna make them all with a little metal detector is that really gonna work for you because you know <laughs> we are the choke point in getting people in but uh so i mean eventually they did kind of see the wisdom of that and waved it for us yeah but there were a lot of little stumbling blocks like that um i'm curious to see how next year will go if things will settle down because we definitely have to re appraise it given what they call it funflation you know yeah right now the economy is dealing with funflation anything that's fun went up in price three times two times yeah. that's that's hard on promoters what else is on the horizon that's but i mean still keep on keeping on you know i mean yeah look forward to to more opportunities, you know, in terms of things being released. YMA has got a bunch of titles lined up, but I can't disclose that. Of uh, course. I'm looking forward to working with a lot of those people, those authors. Uh, nice. Doing such, um, and, you know, Den of Geek is a pop culture website. And what I, what I love about that is that I actually have had the, while I focus on pre predominantly on martial arts and action, action media, um, I, uh, they have done, let me do some foreign film articles. So it was just so refreshing to not write about martial arts, you martial know, arts yeah. art, but you know, just to not have to explain what G means. And, <laughs> you right. Know, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's what I've got in the queue really. I mean, and just, you know, keep on keeping on. Yeah. So, I hear that. Well, I appreciate you coming out tonight and, uh, spending spending all this time with me and for our listeners i really enjoy talking with you and learning all these new things i didn't know it's such a delight to actually have a extended conversation with you as opposed to our email correspondence we've had in the past and one of these one of these years you know we got to go out and do some yum time man i know okay. let's do it yeah that would be bring the time. museum out here or the shaolin show <laughs> i'm giving you two options which you know which one <laughs> um <laughs> okay, we